So, what we're going to do today is a, is a short and hopefully fruitful thread modeling uh, workshop. It's going to be hands-on training. So I'm going to tell you some uh, theory behind the theory behind it, and then you're going to do exercises using the systems that we develop. Um, probably, not probably, definitely the first exercise will be in smaller groups, and uh, the second exercise will be in a bigger group where we'll all discuss uh, attendance up. Um, so let's start. Um, well, I'm going to actually skip this slide because I ah, no, I'm not going to skip this slide for the YouTube people. So about me, I'm the CEO of Codific. My name is Aram and uh, I'm a cybersecurity and privacy expert, uh, which is largely inspired by my PhD in the field from uh, Distinet K Leuven. Um, and one of my area of research was uh, threat modeling and especially privacy threat modeling. And it, so privacy threat modeling is considered to be part of privacy engineering. And uh, I have contributed to the Linden framework, which is now part of the NIST and ISO standard. Meanwhile, uh, I'm also, I've also recently joined the OWASP SAM project as a core team member. And OWASP SAM is a, one of the flagship pro projects in OWASP and it, uh, it is an approach for uh, security assurance. So it covers literally everything uh, in AppSec, in application security, uh, from uh, governance all the way to uh, operations. So enough about me, a couple of words about Codific. So we are an organization, we're a product firm and we have products in the ad tech domain and HR tech domain. And on top of that, we also do some security consultancy here and there. And we have the SAMI product, which is a security assurance management tool for the OWASP SAM project. Now, I have a very simple question, which uh, typically people don't really know how to come up with an answer. And I'm just going to make my slides on my screen a bit bigger because I don't see them. So the question is, if you get this question, is your organization, organization or system secure? Uh, it's a very complicated and trick question, actually. And a lot of security aware organizations, despite having best practices, uh, they, they could come up and say, you know what, here are the typical best practices that we use. Uh, we have some security tooling, but it still doesn't answer the question if the system is secure. And if you say, here, are a, here is a list of answers that you shouldn't give if you get this question. So if you run pen tests, that's good, but it, it, it still doesn't answer the question if the system is secure. You can have patch Tuesdays like Microsoft does. You can have best practices or using HTTPS. Everybody's passing courses. You have ISO certification. All of that is good, but that doesn't answer the question and neither does no, I don't know. That's clearly a bad answer to say. So how, how, do, we, how do we do it? How do we do that? And uh, before we go there, I'm going to first define what is security, because like I said, it's a trick question. You first have to know what is security to be, then to go on with your answer. Um, you have to know what is your system and organization, what is the scope of your system and organization. And probably you would also need to know secure against what and have like maybe you can you can start looking at the attacker profiles and uh, you, you could have a system which is completely offline, which will clearly have different sort of security threats, it might not have any security threats at all. Um, and yeah, the better question is, uh, what is your actually what is your risk profile and how resilient your organization or your system is. So if you have a random a ransomware. How do you recover from that, actually, if there is a successful ransomware attack? Now, what is security? Well, I hope everybody knows here already, but security has three, uh, as a definition, it comes from the CIA, and it is confidentiality, integrity, and availability. And confidentiality is about unauthorized users not having access to your assets. Integrity is about unauthorized users not being able to modify your, your assets and availability is having your assets available there on request. Very, very, very simple. Nothing fancy about it, but to get there, it's super, super complicated, of course. Um, 
Lately, there is also another A added to it, which is um, auditing. Uh, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip that and, and stick to the official definition. Now, what is privacy? Uh, privacy we have in the Linden framework, we have characterized it as uh, seven properties. And Linden actually stands for the opposite of that. So privacy is unlinkability, anonymity, repudiation, non-detectability, confidentiality, awareness, compliance. I'm not going to go through each of these uh, categories and, and explain them. This is not a privacy engineering or privacy threat modeling training. I just want to be complete there. Um, now, let's jump to a much simpler question. And, and we're going to have like this uh, uh, workshop on Friday where we're going to learn to pick locks. Uh, for the YouTube people watching, I didn't say that. Uh, so the, the simpler question is, is your house secure? And if, I, if you get this question, uh, what, what, would you, what would you look at? So I'm, I'm asking this question to, to you guys. So is your house secure? No. no? But, but what, then, what are you going to... You, you imagine you have to be, you're in charge of securing your house. Like, because you have the corporate machine there, and let's say you, you don't do the best practices, you don't do what we're saying, you don't use password manager, your passwords, password is written on the machine, and you have like a, a small uh, textbook with all your passwords written in there, and you have to secure your house, what do you do? <laughs> say what? <laughs> Carry your notebook with you? No, but you still have to secure your house. Okay, yeah, so good. Else? Yeah, that, that, that's, a good, uh, that's a good additional question to ask. What, what do you want to secure it against? Disasters or, or uh, entry, uh, break and entry, fire? Um, and, and then that, that's a good thing to ask. So what am I going to try to secure it against? W what else do you have to look at? If imagine it's against break and entry, what do you have to check? The possible number of entries to the house. The entries to the house, indeed. Um, and then you're probably going to also need to... I have some animations that now shows up. Okay. So, and also, of course, once you think about your house, you need to check if you have actually anything valuable lying around. And this represents a bit the assets um, uh, of in a software system and uh, furthermore something which I missed on the previous slide actually I thought I had some other slides but I don't I skipped them uh, you also need to check whether where is your house like if you live in a very very safe area probably you that you should take that into account as opposed to if you're living in a super criminal neighborhood um, it, it also depends whether Th things like what is the configuration of your house? Do you have a garden? Can somebody enter from your garden? Then you can look at the garden configurations. And if is your garden secure, can somebody enter in your garden? And well, one, once you have that, and by the way, this is my actual house. Uh, as you can see, there was a fire next door. Um, and it's also on Google Street View. So I, I, if I want to protect it from fire, could be an issue because if my neighbor's house catches fire, it might get fire as well. Luckily, it didn't. Uh, but like from Google Street View, I, I don't think I can protect it. So privacy in this in this uh, uh, in this example is an issue. Now, of course, the the it's also an important question, and Nikki said that already. Are we gonna secure against what? So are we gonna look in? Uh, I think so. Yeah, I think I can request to blur it. But it still will be blurred, my house. So, yeah. Um, so, you can have burglary, natural disasters, fire, like I said, Google Street View. And finally, the question that you should also ask is, what is the likelihood and impact of those threats? Like, I mean, there, there was very, very small likelihood of, of this fire. Uh, luckily, the impact in this case was very small, but it could have been a disastrous. Um, and this is something that goes to a little bit to the area of risk, uh, 
risk management and calculating the risks. So if you have something which is very likely, but it has very small impact, then you, your risk is probably going to be small and maybe you don't need to invest that much time into that. So having security is not something absolute. You shouldn't, you shouldn't try to secure a bank vault uh, kind of way, your house, which is probably doesn't have that much of a, an assets in it, um, unless you have a pile load of cash running around. Um, and yeah, so for instance, fire has low likelihood in this case, but has a very high impact, uh, especially after the firemen were there, because then I, I know the house next door was completely destroyed. They had to rebuild the house. I should have done a picture of the house actually. Now it's completely different. Um, Google Street View has almost 100% likelihood unless you live, I don't know, in somewhere where the car cannot pass by, but has in theory negligible or no impact. And uh, yeah, and then once you have that, once you have figured out what are you going to secure it against, what are the threats, what is the likelihood and risk, you can go on and check what you're going to do about it. Um, and probably if you want to be, if you, if you want to, if you want to secure it against burglary, an alarm system would be a, a logical idea to put maybe an insurance uh, against natural disasters and fire, which is actually almost required in Belgium. I know it's not the case in Bulgaria. Um, you could put smoke detectors to make sure if there is a fire that you can uh, run away uh, or sprinklers. I don't know if that's a good idea in the house. Um, and yeah, you could report to Google to get to remove your house from Google Earth and Street View, but I'm not sure if they will react even. I don't think even there is a way to do that, by the way. You, yeah, okay. So it is. And the final step is you, you could go through again from time to time and check if you did a good job. Now, that is everything in the, uh, in the real world. So we go back from analogy to the real question. If your software system is secure, this is the questions you have to ask. And this is where we go into the model of threat, into threat modeling. And in a second, you will be building, a, um, you will be doing this stuff in, in a hands-on workshop. So the theory, I try to keep it limited. We will, we will do a lot of hands-on exercise and then I will tell you much more. There will be probably questions will start popping up then. So there are four questions in trend modeling. What are you building? Um, what can go wrong? What are you going to do about it? So which security controls are you going to put? And if you have that in place, and at the, the last step is, did we do a good enough job? So that last step requires you to go through the countermeasures that you have introduced and make sure that they actually cover the threats that have been, uh, that have been found. And well, this is the essence of security by design. And I have another, so if you think about the software system, by the way, you have to do this at the beginning of when you're planning your software system, not when it has been shipped. Uh, to make sure that you are effective. Um, I have a great analogy from kitesurfing, of course, where else? So, years, anybody knows what this is? You did all kitesurfing course as well, most of you know. So basically these are the lines that you attach the bar to the kite. And years ago, um, there were no, uh, all of the lines were similar, as you can see you have knots in the middle and, and these loops at the, at the ends. And there is kind of no way you can put this wrong. There is no way to, to attach the lines in a wrong way that causes a safety issue. This is safety issue, not a security issue. So safety and security, security is, safety is something that can, that has impact on your health that you couldn't die from. And actually this was the cause of most injuries in kitesurfing. People would atta attach their lines in the wrong way and I, I know there are some people actually died from this. Uh, with this, it's impossible. You can literally not attach the lines in the wrong way. There are colors, you could mix up the colors, no matter, no, it doesn't matter which way you attach them, your kite is still gonna be fly and, and it's gonna be uh, controllable. And uh, years before, it, it was not the case. And the analogy with security 
uh, by design versus security at the end was people write manuals. So please make sure that you attach the right colors or the light, the right way of lines. That is when you have added, well, in this case, safety. That is when you have added safety as an afterthought. If you do this as, as sort of a threat modeling exercise before you have designed the guidelines and you have said, ah, what if people attach them wrong? It not, it's not a good explanation. It's not a good way and of, of getting out of it and saying, you know what, well, they should read the manual, of course, duh, otherwise they shouldn't do kite surfing. That, that's not the way security should work and users are never gonna, you put big, huge red letters in the screen saying, don't do this. Are you sure you wanna do this? Nobody's gonna read it. If you have a yes button, they're still gonna do it. Well, except for my mom, she's gonna come in and panic. Aram, I get these red, red, red letters. What am I gonna do? Relax, relax, don't worry. Um, so, we do thread modeling in, in theory before the system is rolled out, like we're gonna do for attendance radar. Actually, we are a little bit later. We should have done it even before that. Uh, in, and in an agile setting where we do sprints, ideally you do a very small thread modeling exercise before you start working on a sprint. Of course, the sprint could be very functional, not related to security at all, then you don't do it. But you should, if, it's, if it has impact on functionality, if you're gonna add an external single sign-on, for instance, you could do a small threat modeling exercise and to check uh, if there are any threats that you can find and you can um, look for countermeasures. Okay, um, some resources uh, about uh, threat modeling. So there are two great threat modeling books. I think we have one of them uh, in our library and I have the second one at home, but I think that the top right one is, is the great book by the father of threat modeling, I would say Adam Shostak. Um, the lower one actually proposes an approach which is based on uh, threat modeling, threat model as a code in a way. Uh, today we're going to look at the, at the upper one more than the bottom one, but the bottom one allows you to actually write your threat models as a code in Python. It's called PyTM, by threat modeling. It's a really cool approach to look at. And of course, Lindon, if privacy is, is essential for your software system, uh, you could combine all of these approaches with Lindon. Lindon is actually a mnemonic for the threats that you're gonna look for. Okay, I see people yawning, so now we're actually gonna do this. Uh, we're actually gonna do this, but before we do that, I still have a couple of slides to, uh, to cover. Well, again, so we had four things, as you can remember, what are we building? And, uh, we're going to use data flow diagrams for that. I have an, on the next slide, I will show you a quick way how to, how do we do data model, uh, data flow diagrams. It's very easy. The second step is probably the harder thing. How do you find threads? And in theory, everybody can thread model. Probably you're doing thread modeling every day, not from software systems, but it is, it is, it is not uh, exceptional that you think about what if I miss this bus? What am I going to do? I'm going to wait for the next bus. That is like a threat modeling already. Or what if I miss my bus to the air air airport and then I'm late for the plane. So maybe I should go a bit earlier. So there are two buses that I can catch. So if the first one is, if I miss the first one by some small margin, there's still a second one, which uh, for if I catch that one, I'll still make it for my flight. Uh, in software systems, there are different approaches to find threats. Uh, there are, uh, there is the STRIDE, which stands for spoofing, tampering, repudiation, um, information disclosure, uh, denial of service and elevation of privilege. And just by thinking about those categories, you could already come up with some threats. You can go as far as KPEG. KPEG provides you with a huge list of uh, most common threats that there is. So you could start with this list, which will help you a lot. But the problem is this list is huge, 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 and you're going to spend a lot of time on a thread modeling exercise. Ideally, the thread modeling exercise should be about an afternoon or a couple of hours. Definitely, if it's in the sprint planning, it shouldn't take more than a couple of hours because you're already going to go have the DFT, the data flow diagram in place. And sometimes, and actually most of the times, uh, it will be about the experience that you have already. You know some threats, you know some uh, attack scenarios that you or your team can help you come up with. Um, and the more you do this, the better you're going to get at uh, finding threats. 
uh, pen test reports actually can also help because there are actual exploits which you can use and check if those threads apply to the to the other systems now what you're going to do about it this is about putting security controls in place uh, there are quite some resources about that you might be adding a second factor authentication for the pro potential problem of uh, password spraying was it Mitko? was it called the password spraying attack yeah, so against password spraying attacks, you might add multi-factor authentication. And the countermeasures or the controls that you're going to add uh, is something that, that uh, there are also quite some libraries about that. There is OWASP uh, ESVS. There are quite some OWASP cheat sheets that you can use for different threats, or threats that you come up with. And finally, the last point is, uh, did, we good, did we do a good job? You could go and run through control validation and then that's something that we're gonna actually do with uh, Peter and Mitko who's uh, on the meet. Um, we're gonna actually start writing test cases that check our controls and verify them. So it's not like we're gonna add this thing and hope that it works. Uh, we're gonna actually write tests about it and actually often we our captures didn't work for rate limitation um, because there, this capture library which we use is it's very complicated to set up. And often the, it seems like Captcha is working because you get the Google thing appearing with the Captcha, but it doesn't work. So uh, ideally you wanna have uh, automated validation of this stuff, or at least you can also walk through it manually. Now, TFD, how do we do that? Uh, there are five types of things that you, that you have. It's actually creating a small diagram of your software system nothing complicated, but there are five type of things that you can use to do that. So five type of things which we're interested in. And I don't think this will be an, uh, a problem for any one of you. We have, I'm going to start in, a, in not in the same order as they're written here. I'm going to start from data store. So this is where you store your data. Typically it's databases and file systems where you store the data. That's it. Right. Uh, then we have a process which processes some data. It can be, it's typically running code written in a, in a programming language or, or some packaged binary, doesn't matter in which language. Uh, you, it, it's not essential to know the language that it's written, by the way. Then we have an external entity, which is your user, typically. Uh, it's people, it could be also code, which is outside the control. It's outside your control. It's not part of your system. It's the external entity. And you, you write yeah, all the way down. I'm not sure if you guys can see it all the way down. I have also the types of boxes that you have to draw for that. There are, by the way, tools for that, but we're not going to use tools today. Um, then we have, well, we have data flow. So that's the flow of data from one point to another. We are interested in trend modeling. We're interested in modeling your system and seeing how the data flows in the system. So we don't care about components. Don't, don't try to design every tree in the forest. We're going to try to design a tree. So when you start with this, try to keep it as high level as possible. Uh, and then we have trust boundary, which is typically um, if you have a VPN or if, if you have a system exposed to, exposed to the internet, everything could be encapsulated in a trust boundary and your user is outside of it uh, uh, while your uh, system is inside of it. So it is also, it basically answers the question who controls what could be organizational boundaries, physical machines, and so on. Um, so here is an example of, of a DFT diagram for a web system, um, which apparently exposes its SQL database uh, to the outside world as you can connect it with an SQL client. So in the, here we have the data stores. There is some data management and logs. Uh, database here is intended as something that actually processes and communicates with these stores. This is the process and these are the, the, the stores. Then there is a DB admin, which is like a, again, it's a process. It's a high level process that where the, the human, the external entity can communicate and probably check everything. And then we also have the front end where web clients are connected. Could be a browser, typically it's a browser and SQL clients, which is something you should probably never do. I just copy pasted it from, uh, uh, I think it's from Adam's book. Um, so yeah, it's not like you should do this or you should use this. Um, 
Then there is some process that does log analysis and there are again DB users and DB administrator as external entity. And then we also have trust boundaries uh, around the database processes and the database cluster uh, which is the bigger uh, square rectangle. This is uh, this is how you would typically draw a DFT. So, and we're going to do it in a second or in a minute. Again, don't try to model your system as components. It has to stay high level and uh, you, you're going to try to find threads in the later part of the workshop. Uh, so you have to model the system some basic, and this is a good starting point, by the way. Uh, Many of the, of, of the systems that we have have something in common here. Clearly, we don't expose SQL as, a, as, a, as an external thing. Um, yeah, I have some do's here and don'ts. So make sure you can tell the main use case scenarios using your DFT. Again, don't, don't try to model the whole, the, every tree as it is. You should start small and extend as you, as you go. So if, you, if there are some things which you cannot explain and it needs some specifics, you could add new entities to your, to your diagram. Yeah, data cannot move itself from one place to another. So you always need a process. You cannot move uh, data from a store to a user. You will need a process. That's why we had a database as, as a process in the previous picture. Uh, if you have disagreements, this is going to be very common uh, about whether you should put something on it or not. Again, think about that the purpose of the DFT is to find threads and not showing it how your system works. You're also not going to show it to your management board or anything. The purpose is to find threads. If you can find a thread based on a smaller uh, DFT, it's probably better. So try to be pragmatic about it. Uh, yeah, this I said it, don't imagine a forest, you don't want to model every tree, you just want to model the forest in, in general. And if you really need to model one tree, just model one tree. Um, yeah, now it's, it's up to you guys. I don't know if you have any questions uh, so far. Um, probably you will have questions when you start doing it. So, ready? This is not long. I have a couple of more slides, well eight slides to be exact. And then we're going to look for threads. So there are different ways to look for threads or what can go wrong. There is the stride approach, the stride mnemonic. And there is the concept of attack trees, which is very cool actually. These are not trees outside that are going to attack you. Uh, uh, there is KPEC, which is a common attack pattern enumeration and classification list, which is very extensive. Um, you can also use OWASP top 10 to look for threads or basically use your experience. Uh, this is where the magic happens. So typically to, do, to run this workshop, you're going to ideally in an actual setting, you're going to look for threads together in a group for X amount of hours. You're going to fix this time, a couple of hours to find threads and then you're going to go on and maybe get together again in a couple of months and look more, for more threads. So this is not there. It's, it's a time bound exercise. It's not like you're going to find threats until you die or until you faint or th there is also no limit in theory. There is no concept of we did find all threats. It's kind of impossible to find all threats. Um, okay. So the, the several approaches, how, how, just a couple of slides on them. I can talk about this for days. There is actually a book written about this. So you should probably read the book if you're interested on Stride, but basically Stride uh, lists six different categories of threads. And when you're looking for threads, it's helpful to think about these categories and look for threads from these categories. And the first category is spoofing. It's pretending to be someone then other than yourself. So you try to spoof the user. Typically, you can also spoof processes. You can spoof data flows. Uh, there, there is like a matrix, matrix which category applies to which type of uh, entity. The entities on your DFT. Tampering is when you're going to change something on disk memory or network. Repudiation is claiming that you didn't do something. Actually, it's funny in privacy, you actually want the opposite of that. You want to claim you didn't do something. And that's a, pri a privacy threat and a security threat in this case are the complete opposites. 
Uh, information disclosure, you're getting access to something that you shouldn't. Denial of a service, uh, just blocking the server resources so that other users cannot use it. And elevation of privilege, you get more access than you, than you should have. When you're looking for threats, you can categorize them, but it's not very important. So this is important. You can use these to find threats, but once, once you find a threat, it doesn't matter if it's a spoofing or if it's repudiation and so on. It, can be also, it could be actually multiple things at the same time. Attack trees. Um, so if this is a helpful mechanism, so this is not the only attack tree. This is one sample attack tree of spoofing an external entity. And when you think about, I'm going to spoof a client, there are different tracks that you can start to think about. Like, for instance, I'm going to obtain his credentials by all these ways that are listed down there. I'm going to have to obtain. So you're going to maybe steal his credentials in, in transit, or you're going to steal them from a storage at a server or at a client or at a third party. So there are different approaches that you can think about. Is this thing possible? So it's a bit more detailed uh, list of things that can happen during spoofing. Or for instance, authentication UI, you're gonna somehow trick him to go to a website which is ex looks exactly like the website of your bank and then you're gonna steal his credentials like that. Uh, and so here you have like a more elaborate way of uh, finding threats, uh, elaborate way like a mind map or high level patterns that can help you think about possible issues. Um, somehow my next slide is doing the exercise, which, which is weird. I have the feeling that some slides are missing. Uh, yeah, apparently I don't have more slides. So about, and the next step we're gonna do is find actual threats. Um, I'm gonna tell a bit more. So the KPEG is actually a website where you have I think 200 of different most common uh, attack uh, pattern enumeration. A lot of them. The problem there is you can go through them, but there are a lot. So if you imagine you have two hours to find threads going over 256 that you have never seen before, or maybe you have seen some of them, no way you can go through them. So it takes a lot of time. OWASP top 10 is nice. And you all did the course on OWASP top 10, except for Peter and Dimitar. Uh, you guys are going to get it like this week or next week, um, an experience. And typically we, you should do threat modeling in a group. So hopefully you have people who have experience. You have other people who know maybe some more uh, attack trees. You can also use the attack trees, which are, like I said, there are attack trees in the threat modeling book uh, for every type of every category of threat and every type of entity. Well, not every type, because for some of them, there are things that don't apply. But like, for instance, I think repudiation doesn't apply to data store. So there are no attack trees there, but there are maybe 20 or 30 attack trees that you can use. Last part, uh, there are no more exercises, no more hands on. Um, so the last part of the, of the threat modeling is to walk through the findings and walk through the controls. You also have to actually mitigate those threats. That's something we didn't really do yet. You know, in, a, in a thorough way. But you have to go through the findings and you have to go through the countermeasures and see if you have done a good enough job, which could be you can either go through it theoretically as a, as a whiteboard exercise. You could do a practical simulation or uh, switch in the red team to try to hack it. Uh, or you could even hire an external team. People on YouTube watching this, you can hire Codifix red team to to walk through your countermeasures. Um, well, once you have the threats, you have the mitigations, there is still a part which is the actual risk assessment. So you, you want to bring in a risk assessment behind that uh, because you're, you might not be solving all the threats. You might not have to, to have the time. Some threats might have very low likelihood. So it's, it's interesting to look whether it makes sense to to go and fix it rather than just to accept the risk. So th there are different sort of, there are different types of risk assessment methodologies. I'm not gonna go through all of them. Uh, some of them are very complicated, but the main 
difference between risk assessment methodologies is there are quantitative and qualitative risk assessment methodologies. The qualitative is you can use like these informal labels, likelihood, low, medium, high, impact, low, medium, high, and then risk is just a product of those two. And uh, FAIR is quantitative, so in a quantitative risk assessment methodology you can use numbers on a scale from 0 to 10, which you could even plug in some conversion to dollar values. So you can say this threat could result in a risk which will cost our organization X amount of money. And then based on that, you can prioritize them and look whether you want to fix it or not. Um, there, is, there is a risk assessment methodology called DREAD, which is actually uh, now deprecated. It's no longer used. I think it was introduced by Microsoft. Uh, but it's still actually often cited and I think it's still being used. Uh, in our case, I would say we could uh, use a very simple qualitative uh, risk assessment methodology with a low, medium, high uh, for likelihood and impact. And likelihood is how likely is this to be exploitable and to take place and to happen. And impact is how, how big is the impact. I think we've I've mentioned this. So when when should you do threat modeling? Ideally, is before you start building the system, um, or during or before each sprint, you can you can plug this in in your sprint and add this in your sprint planning, um, and you can do a small every time you you add new features to the system, you can do a small uh, small exercise of looking for threats. Um, and um, you can even do it after you have the system in place. The problem is fixing the problems or fixing the issues is going to be way more expensive after you have designed the system because there might be things which you just have to redo all over if you figure out that this is not working. Um, a good question is, so when are we done? When do we stop this thread modeling? How many hours? And I, I, I think I also mentioned this a little bit. Um, you're actually never done uh, and security is a, is a process. It's, there, is no, there is no end goal. Ideally, you should do this on, on uh, well-defined time boxes like we did now. This is, you, you, you might say, okay, well, we found some threats mostly are in one category. It, it doesn't matter. We did, we did a good job and every time we do this exercise, we're going to get better and better. We're going to come up in, in higher maturity level for threat modeling. You're going to already have, because we have using kind of similar technology through each project, we could have even a library of threads which could be applicable to other projects. So instead of starting for looking for Stride or KPEG or these other ways of finding threads, we can go through, first we can go through a list which we already have, which were threads in other projects, and then we could start from there. It is likely that they would be applicable for each of them. Not for maybe, not for the Bluetooth, uh, attendance tracking, but other type of threats are likely to be everywhere. Um, well, yeah, security is like happiness. It's a journey, not a destination. And this concludes uh, this workshop.